All right, welcome back. It's still the breakfast and plus TV Africa. Away from off the press now, we have Mercy joining us. Good morning to you, Mercy. <laughs> Why do I feel like a special guest on you the show? You are a special guest. Of well, it's good to be, it's good to see you first of all, and yeah, it's good to good you know. Thank you so much. It's actually not black; it's navy blue. So tell me, I don't have colors anymore. Yeah, That's now right. I'm color blind. And it feels great to be back in your screen this uh, beautiful uh, Tuesday morning. No, it's a, Wednesday morning. Wednesday. it's a Wednesday morning. It's a Wednesday morning. I mean, if you Tuesday? if if you know what's going on in the city of Lagos, <laughs> then you would understand that you know it's so difficult. What a time to be a Nigerian! But however, we're hoping that you know all of this would be resolved, and then of course we would actually you know move on and move forward. Yes, uh, I, Nigerians are actually biting, you know, and uh, feeling the biting effect of uh, you know the fuel scarcity, and. Uh, my God, mercy! You, you and the imagine. fact that it causes the traffic—that's the annoying thing. The traffic thing. in Lagos is just horrendous. It's just terrible. So it's a combination of the fact that you have fuel scarcity. That's on the one hand, coupled with the fact that there's a lot of rehabilitation work going on mm. in different parts of Lagos. I mean, majorly you have the VGC Adjar Axis. I mean, being. That, that work. I really don't know what's going to happen. Okay. That rehabilitation work is also constituting. Naturally, you would say that Lagos would always experience, you know, the traffic. But with all of these activities, the fact that people would have to queue up uh, filling stations, yeah. you have them on the road, by the roadside. Spend longer time. And so longer time. So all of the queues, making the roads very narrow. But yeah. we need to move away this morning, looking at our first major uh, conversation as the issue of the constitutional amendment and uh, the proposed items or the items that has been considered. Now, in continuance of its constitutional amendment process, Nigeria's Houses of Parliament and the National Assembly comprising the House of Representatives and the Senate voted on 68 proposed amendments to the country's constitution. A move unprecedented since it was drafted under the military rule in 1999. And these proposed amendments were the result of zonal hearings held across uh, the country in 2021. The voting saw the National Assembly grant financial and administrative autonomy to all local governments in the country. They voted for independent candidacy in elections and separated the office of the Attorney General of the Federation. From that of the Minister of Justice, however, lawmakers voted against the pension for presiding officers of the National Assembly and rejected uh, virtually all provision designed to improve women inclusion in Nigerian politics and society. Now, some of the bills passed on Tuesday that was yesterday include financial independence of the state houses of assembly and the state judiciary moving of airports from exclusive list to the concurrent legislative list and allowing states to generate, transmit, and distribute electricity in areas not covered by the national grid. Others also include a bill that sets a time frame for submission of names of ministerial and commissioner nominees and others, uh, and also a time frame for the conduct of census, one that enshrines free and compulsory basic education as fundamental human right. Now, it's actually a very lengthy one, but some of the bills which were thrown out by the lawmakers bordered on the termination of tenure on account of political party defection, that's diaspora voting and procedure for overriding president's veto for constitution alteration and the virtual court hearing, also immunity for presiding officers of the National Assembly, heads of judiciary was also rejected. At this point in time, we will be being, we're going to be joined by a lawyer and a former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly, John Gall Lebor. Uh, good morning, John Gall Lebor. It's good to have you join us. No, Mercy, before we take John, uh, we understand that we have um, the video uh, of um, how it went down. We'll just give you a summary of um, how it went down yesterday, and then we'll come talk to John. And uh, we have so much to talk with, to John about because uh, I really need to understand some of these great areas. In a moment, um, John will be joining us. Stay with us. Certainly, all of you are aware of uh, the acrimony that almost existed and the legal altercation that took place in River State with regards to that. Now the Constitution is saying that the VAT is reserved for the exclusive lease. It's made it clear and that is how it's going to be. So it belongs to the federal government. So we are also gender-sensitive parliament. Like we mentioned in our legislative agenda that we are going to project gender issues to give them the fairness that they desire 
well as the quality uh, that they desire. And um, this constitution is asking for special seat in legislature for women, both in the National Assembly and also the Houses of um, Assembly all through the nation. Beyond that, also affirmative action for women in political parties. So it's going to be you know, a space for our women because they are more in number. This constitution is saying we are recognizing you even in our political party affairs. And uh, the women in the house work so hard uh, to make sure that this comes to fruition, especially my own dear sister, Honorable Kiru Onyo Georgia. Um, they work so hard to make sure that this is achieved for women. And I think uh, Nigerian women are going to remember them for a very long time. Well, um, that's it. Joining us this morning to make sense of the uh, Constitution Amendment uh, that has been ongoing is the former Speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly, John Gall Lebor. Good morning, John Gall. It's good to have you join us. Good morning. My pleasure to be here. All right, so John, let's get straight to the crux of the matter. Do you think that the items on the Constitution Amendment, uh, items on that bill to be amended is relevant to Nigeria and it reflects the immediate needs and concerns of Nigeria at the time. Yes, I, I, th I think so. Um, constitutional amendment is usually an ongoing exercise um, depending on the circumstance of the fact of each case and depending on the issues as formulated. Uh, you talked about public hearing the other time. The foundation of any constitution amendment is public hearing. That means that as you go back to your constituencies to hold this public hearing, you feel the pulse of the people, you look at, you identify the needs and the areas of priority, so you form the basis. And the main reason why a lot of items may be dropped at the, after public hearing is the main reason why a lot of items may be added after public hearing. It's the main reason why at the end of voting, some of the items that were earlier articulated at public hearing may not be taken. So everything is dependent on the needs of society and the circumstance of each case. Uh, if you look at the items rate, you see that uh, particularly the issue of the devolution of power is quite necessary. Now we need it moving forward as a country to be able to achieve uh, a true federation. And then also the issues of the independence of the legislature, the independence of the lo of local government systems and the independence of the judiciary is also an important issue. Argued um, against this because uh, some persons are saying the issue of insecurity has not been. I mean, there's no, there's really nothing to actually address the issue of insecurity. And then we look at the major concern: how uh, you know funds are being shared. I mean, talking about the federation accounts, the issue of restructuring. Uh, he doesn't really talk about restructuring in its real sense, how, uh, you know, funds should be shared. Now, you have some proponents who are saying that we should have been considering the 1963 constitution that allows, you know, region. At the time, it was a regional um, government that we practiced before we now had the state government, where you have the 50-30 or 50, 20, and then the 30 to the polls. And uh, some people are saying this does not really, really reflect the needs of Nigerians at the time. I think that to understand the fact that uh, you cannot amend all the provisions of the Constitution in one legislative uh, session or in uh, one round, uh, if this exercise whatever is achieved on this exercise should become the backdrop of an agenda for the next assembly. You, when you listen to the spokesperson of the House, he actually highlighted no. that their legislative agenda is towards a certain area. And then it is because of that legislative agenda that they identify the issues as currently before the House. Now, when you look at the issue of a devolution of power, you are moving towards restructuring, basically. Um, you cannot deal with restructuring without looking at the foundation of the geopolitical zones, the recognition of the three of the six geopolitical zones first, and whatever uh, you're talking about in terms of resource control also has to be dealt with. But we have not gotten to that point. Our yes. democracy is still not right to that point. We are still practicing the unitary system of government in a democracy, in the sense that you have a strong federal government and then you have very weak states. 
an, a completely absent local government system. Now, gradually, with the amendment that is being proposed, I'm sure by the time we get to the next assembly, you begin to see more items uh, come up. Now, when you're looking at the issue of devolution of power, for instance, uh, the issues that were taken just involved the issue of power generation by state, the issue of um, uh, railway, and all of that. Those issues are too minor. Why, what a, why didn't they take the issue of solid minerals in states? They are still critical areas. So you see, this, the National Assembly is still very protective of the, of, uh, the uh, federal government because they are, they are also part of the federal government. They are the legislature of the federal government. So they are protecting a lot of these issues you have raised on behalf of themselves and the federal government. Now you talked about the issue of security and insecurity. It's difficult to bring up the issue of security and insecurity in the constitution because the constitution only provides for a framework for a security management. That is why you have, for well, the first framework you have, uh, the various institutions. You have the police, you have the army, you have the navy, you have the civil defense and all of that. If you want to deal with the issue of security properly, you have to go back outside of the constitution to the laws of the federation. You look at the police act. You know recently, uh, last year or so, the police act was amended to deal with the sort of order. The problem with the police is like someone that has the cancer and they give the instrument and you can't treat it in one day. And the same thing with the army, you know, for a long period of time, you know that you can't deal with the issue of army by one simple simple constitutional provision. So this constitutional exercise I mean and some of the thing as or um, um, it, 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 it project in progress and it should be there to instrumentally. We need to be a little bit patient to them. And then we also need to be very, uh, we need to produce constitutional activists who will deal with the issue and raise the boundary of I, I get an agenda that the National Assembly should deal with in the constitutional amendment for the National Assembly. As it's going on now, it is completely under their control. They determine what they want to take, they raise the issues that bring it to constitutional amendment, and then all of us flow from there. All right, uh, Mr. Lebo, let's talk about some of the provision. Uh, thank you for giving a bit of a background concerning all that um, Nigerians expect, you know, uh, from this um, fifth um, alteration. You know, there has been uh, so much talk concerning um, true federalism. I want us to stay on the VAT, you know, for instance, uh, and uh, Lagos State and Aquaibom, they are hailing the fact that um, the Senate um, and Reps have retained um, VAT on the concurrent list. Uh, you know, it's as though the federal government is losing out, as it were. But is this, um, you know, a good development in your opinion? Yes, I think it's a good development in my opinion. Um, because first, I will, I will just try to like, like to deal with the first, the first issue Nigeria has that has made it very difficult for us to develop is the fact that certain laws that have been provided and certain items in the exclusive legislative list, is, if you continue to retain them, Nigeria is going to get into reverse uh, development. The first of that is VAT. The second is revenue mobilization law. Mm -hmm. The revenue mobilization law that we have it now, Nigeria is the only country in the world with such a law, a law that is designed only to generate and share. A law that does not encourage states, local government, and the various regions of Nigeria, you know, to develop on their own. A law that is virtually like a, a revolving fund to, to bail out states in the same sort of difficulty. If a state cannot generate money, why are you sharing from the national coffers? The reason why our GDP cannot grow, the reason why our foreign cannot grow, because we have to share. That revenue mobilization law is one of those laws that need to be repealed or amended to meet the exigencies of the state. The second issue which you have raised very is the issue of VAT. I mean, I don't know, in terms of gross domestic product of every country, the GDP that is the growth of a country, if you look at GDP is a geographic, is a zonal issue. If you look at the uh, America, for instance, and you see that America with a 24.2 trillion uh, GDP, some states like California have 3.6 uh, uh, trillion GDP. The some states like New York has 1.9 trillion GDP. That's states in America. Now, if you check at the economy of Russia, the GDP of Russia, the state of California is inside of Russia. The state of New York is inside of Russia. That is how it's supposed to be. Now, with the VAT system, you are modeling everybody under one GDP control system. You are modeling everybody under one development control system. Lagos State, by the GDP of Lagos is about the fifth or sixth richest uh, 
it will be the truth of security country in Africa. Akwai will stay to be about nine, or, and it has to be about eleven. But at this, it, the structure that we have, where the, the VAT is exclusive under the federal government control, you have some states like in the north, Tanu, they don't consume alcohol. The bulk of that VAT comes from consumption of alcohol. Then you centralize, collect all, and then share it to them. A person who does not consume alcohol because the skill is um, is a crime or is a, a religious thing, but it shares in the VAT itself is wrong. You're not you're not supporting productivity. You're not developing ability, and this things will not continue. I know the reason why um, the federal government is very edgy because this is subject is already the Supreme Court is going to deliver judgment uh, this March. I think around 15th or 16th of March. And, that, and once that judgment is given February to the state, Nigeria is on the path of progress and development. Okay, but um, just before, you know, um, we also look at another issue, because the issue of local government, as much as we have said that the local government is also a third tier of government, and it should be treated, you know, with some level of independence, just as you have the federal, you know, the state, and of course the local. But some people are saying that creating, because, uh, you know, you have this bill seeking to create, um, you know, special funds for the local government. That shouldn't be the concern of the federal government. It should be within the jurisdiction of the state government. And it still brings us back to the issue why we do not, because if you still talk about all of this, it boils down to, you know, state controlling their resources and going back to the regional system where you have states, you know, having 50% of what they actually generate and they can send 20, you know, to the, um, uh, you know, center. And of course, 30 can actually be distributed amongst the units as well. So uh, what are your thoughts on this one now? Local government, should, be, should it be a concern? Should the federal government be bothered about creating special funds for, um, you know, the local government? Or should that not be the concern of the state government? Okay, first of all, the federal government should be concerned. And the reason why the federal government should be concerned is that the local government is the third tier of government. As you have the federal, you have the state, you also have the local government. Because the federal government is concerned about states, they're even in, engaging in bailouts for states. The federal government should also be concerned about local government. That's one. Without the local government structure or system, there will be no federal government, there will be no state government. So the federal government should be concerned. The second reason why the federal government should be concerned is because Basically, 80 or 60 percent of what the state government use in terms of funding to run the state and the local government use to run the local government come from the federation allocation account through the revenue mobilization. So the money in the first place does not belong to the state per se. It's given to them by the federal government, and the local government also get the funds as well from the federal government. Now, what the state government has done is to bridge the gap, take over the place of the local government, and run the local government in their own style and manner. Is a, is a big problem. One of the reasons why we're having security today is because of the non-existent local government system, where the chairman of local government is supposed to be the chief security officer of the local government, is like an appointee of the governor, is nominated and appointed by the governor through an election process. And then when you have the councillor, they are also like the appointees of the chairman of local government, where the legislators do not have security, uh, legislative vote, where the local government security uh, as architecture, including security votes, are not available. The state government don't make funds available to them. They allocate state funds to local government, like ministries and departments. So it's a, a difficult issue. The state government ought to take responsibility, but at the point we are, the federal government must play a role in providing a local government reform system. I'll give you a typical example. Number one, every state today has a ministry of local government. But why does the federal government not have the minister of state? In, for in, in charge of states, a minister who is superintends over all state governors. No, you don't have that uh, by, by the federal government. But at the state, they have the commissioner for local government. He's virtually the super chairman of local government. Then you have the local government service commission. Now, you mean that that local government service commission and the commissioner for local are all appointed by the governor. Now, you also have issues like primary health care. You have issue of... Uh, 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 primary education and all of that, they are all dealt with by the state government. Now, when you look at the appointment, the, the management of primary health care, the governor of the state appoints the DGO or the staff of the primary health care. When you look at the staff of the local government system, it's appointed by the local government service commission, and the commissioners are also appointed by the governor. So, when you're talking about 
special fund for local government, the first thing you need to deal with is to deal with the administrative autonomy of the local government system first. Unless you dissolve the joint allocation account, which is currently in existence, and unless you take away part of the administrative responsibility of local government, and also will be taken away by them by state government ministries and agencies. The Ministry of Local Government has taken over 80% of their responsibility. The Commissioner for Local Government has taken away 80% of their responsibility. The uh, local government service, there's no local government chairman today in, in Nigeria that can recruit staff into his local government. You want staff, you go to uh, local government service commission, they recruit for you. You want uh, the staff in, your, in the local government uh, uh, medical department, you go to primary health care agency appointed by the governor. You want staff for primary school, you have to go to primary school management board, as the case may be. So as far as I'm concerned, there's no local government system. The local government system is part of the Ministry of State Government. So this amendment is not, for me, is not enough to deal with the issue. As long as the governors are not ready, as long as the governors are not ready, and as long as the local All right, uh, government Mr. system is completely controlled okay. of the governor, and as long as you have a different account, you're going to have this issue. All right, Mr. Lebo, because of time, there are lots of um, provisions, a lot of um, voting stuff that were done um, yesterday. But I just want to ask uh, which... Uh, uh, which of them were the major highlights for you? Because uh, uh, the National Assembly also rejected pension for presiding officers of our legislature, declined them part to override the president's veto, uh, turns down proposal for special seats for women in legislature, among others. Which of them actually hit you uh, as uh, really very, very striking? Um, I feel that the independence of the judiciary is quite critical, very fundamental and important because you know, the judiciary is the hope of the common man and the last man. And if you check um, in terms of our evolving democracy, the judiciary has played an important role in determining what uh, is right and what is constitutional. Now, with the new electoral amendment system, you need the judiciary to sit up to be able to put things right. Because you can see that politicians are still not ready uh, to ab ab abide by that new electoral law. We've seen violence in different elections across the by-elections I heard this week. So you need the judiciary to stand up. So that stand up for me. The second is the autonomy of the legislature. It's quite important. No matter how various legislatures have been hijacked in some states by governors, you need the House of Assembly to be autonomous in terms of their finances. If the House of Assembly has its autonomy, it will not be able to sit down and legislate and provide for the autonomy of the local government system. Where you have it, a speaker and the House of Assembly members who don't have their own autonomy, they will not even value the autonomy of the local government system. The thought is the autonomy of the local government system. And the fact that this time they have actually dealt with the issue of administrative autonomy of the local government system, then abrogation of JAC, the Joint Allocation Account Commission. I mean, that's quite uh, good. Then I was also impressed with the devolution of powers. You know, I, I, I wish they had gone further into other issues like mining and all of that. But the fact that they're there is the way, the fact that they're there with power generation and all of that is a sign that they have started so far. The exclusively is too packed up for the federal government. We need to decongest it and move a lot of items to the concurrent list. So that is, is good for me. I'm also not impressed with the fact that they dropped the issue of uh, women and then um, uh, they are control in terms of uh, uh, political offices. You know, I, I feel that that issue ought to have been dealt with. I don't know what the situation is with the independent candidature, you know, and then, so it's another touchy issue. Then the office of the Attorney General, separating the office of the Attorney General, quite critical. I doubt if the President will give assent to such a bill, but I feel that it's also very important. Then trying to override the veto of the President is is, is okay, but I doubt if the president is going to ascend that. If the president himself will sign out himself the authority to ascend to the constitutional amendment, I doubt if that will happen. But I feel that the death is quite a lot of issues, and um, hopefully, um, looking at the next amendment, they should be able to deal with that issue. I hope they achieve, uh, uh, they get the president to be able to ascend to some of these bills when he's come on night for it as a deal to you. For John Golego, uh, one of the issues that have actually, you know, really plagued us as a country and where we are right now is the issue of revenue generation. If you look at it, it seemed to be a very, you know, huge problem. A lot of persons would actually think that uh, this constitutional review and amendment process would consider, um, you know, the funding formula 
funding formula, maybe find ways to allow, you know, state to actually take advantage of, um, for instance, Cross River State, blessed with, you know, natural resources. Let them, you know, harness it and generate their revenues for themselves and manage it. Because that's a major problem. The idea of having to go to the center to collect, you know, um, handouts, as some people would call it, has really not taken us anywhere far. With the fact that you have a lot of divestment going on right now, you have some of these companies divesting, and then you know stakeholders are coming up with one or two policies. But that's on the one hand. Another fundamental issue that some persons have said, they say the 1999 constitution says we the people. The fact that we the people never gave a consent to that constitution, a constitutional amendment can never solve the problem. We need to get to a point where we have a representation of the people and of course talk about the interest. So this constitutional amendment process, some people think that this does not solve the problem of we the people, where the people originally were not represented, what brought about the 1999 constitution. I'd like to share your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, um, let's go back to the basic issues. If you have three arms of government, you have the legislature whose responsibility is to pass and amend laws. You have the executive whose responsibility is to run government and execute policies of government. You have the judiciary that uh, will, will give justice and interpretation to the provisions of the law. It means that you have assessed the powers of making laws and certain other responsibility to the one of the three of government. Now, when you, are, when you have a legislature where you have appointed, you have, nominated, you have, you have uh, uh, voted for your senators and members of the House of Reps and the House of Assembly, you have assessed the powers to make laws, to amend laws, including the constitution to them. So let's go back to the basic issue. The basic issue is that Nigeria has a very poor merit architecture system for governance and leadership. We send very poor, uh, ill-equipped uh, people to the legislature. The legislature is like a place for political contractors. You know, you go there and you find people without any background understanding of what the issue should be. So it is the quality of what you're finding now in the national in, in the constitutional amendment is, is dependent on the quantity of the legislators that you have. I mean, you have um, you have you can you cannot run away from the fact that a quality legislature should be able to deal with the issue of devolution of power as it relates to revenue control. Um, I, as I've been, I was speaking in Cross River State, and I know that the legislature was virtually on sabbatical. When I say on sabbatical, is because most of the issues that would have formed the base of our legislative assignment have already been quarantined to the federal government under the exclusive list. So what we have is just to sit there and take resolutions from government and pass it and then approve uh, the budget and then uh, setting resolutions to borrow money. We don't have, there's no serious House of Assembly in Nigeria right. that has the content of issues to deal with. All right, uh, Mr. Lebo. Uh thank you for all of those insights that you have shared. Another term, provision that people feel, uh, Nigerians feel, should be looked into is that of um, citizen by marriage. As it is right now, all we have is that um, when a Nigerian man uh, you know, gets married to a foreigner, automatically she becomes a Nigerian. But that's not the case you know, when a woman you know, marries a man from outside Nigeria. What do you really think, John? I, I, think, I, think, I think we thought it's the same thing we're talking about our um, our, our cosmopolitan intelligence, we are developing very slow because this issue should have been, shouldn't, it's not an arguable issue. It's an issue that should be dealt with. There is a minimum international benchmark and stand, standard for citizens' management across the world. And it is shocking that Nigeria was still struggling with that issue. It is the quality of our representation, the quality of our, our, of, our of, of, the, of the National Assembly, and the quality of human capacity that we have in government that's causing this. I feel that. These issues should have been dealt with. If you provide any any woman or any lady who marries a Nigerian should become a Nigerian citizen. That's the standard all over the world. I, I wonder why we are delaying about that. So I feel that we need to deal with that quickly. I'm also impressed with the diaspora voting. If mm. the assent can be given, is also another issue that uh, is, bench, is benchmark. I feel that we should keep moving. Um, Unfortunately, they are not hitting the target as we expect, but given, given the next strategy, we will be able to deal with that. Let's produce more constitutional activists to formulate issues for the National Assembly that will form the basis of a future constitutional amendment. 
All right, many thanks, uh, John Golalebo. We really appreciate your time this morning and uh, making our time to be part of the breakfast. We look forward to sharing your thoughts on some of these issues as we proceed. Thank you very much. All right, John Golalebo is a legal practitioner and a former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. Uh, we, we definitely continue this discuss. A great top on the list has been the fact that uh, the women will be protesting as regards uh, the special seats. <laughs> yeah, the special seat. <laughs> okay. No, not the marriage issue. Majorly, I think the concern is about the fact that women are not, uh, you know, included, given the, the additional seats that were supposed to be created for women mm -hmm. and the representation at the end of the day. That's also another one. And so, uh, let's see how that pans out. Maybe. Just maybe this lawmakers may can reconsider Hopefully. that particular one. But that's it. Uh, we step on the bridge right now. When we return, we'll be looking at our second topic. Stay with us.